I'm spending a few weeks in Budapest where I'm giving some public lectures, doing media, and meeting with other conservatives from around the European Union. And I had a conversation recently with a Dutch sociologist named Eric Hendricks, who's a resident fellow at the Danube Institute, which is hosting my stay. And he proposed a provocative theory or a provocative thesis. He said that uh, in the West, we're trapped in a modernity loop. This has really been our basic political cycle since the French Revolution. And it's a three-part loop. He describes it as beginning with a revolutionary fervor, going into a period of violent terror, and then collapsing at the end of the cycle into a period of disillusionment. The goal, of course, is always equality. And this changes generation to generation, the specific uh, timbre or flavor or uh, ideology shifts uh, as historical conditions change. But he argues that from generation to generation, the cycle has really been always the same. I think what this is at heart is a, almost a Burkean analysis of the excesses of left-wing revolution. Historical examples, of course, starting from the French Revolution, going from Robespierre to Napoleon, um, the Chinese Cultural Revolution, something I've been thinking about in my own work, uh, from Chairman Mao's the kind of 1960s fervor, uh, all the way to Deng Xiaoping, where the Chinese communists retrenched. Uh, they stopped some of their most revolutionary activities and adopted the principles of capitalism. And even in the US, you can see, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, the new left um, that came to a fruition and the violent revolution of the Black Panther Party, eventually leading to Richard Nixon and then Richard Nixon's resounding reelection in 1972. And the lesson here, I think, is that the pursuit of equality often ends with unintended consequences and the period of chaos is then followed by a period of stabilization, uh, retrenchment, or in some cases, uh, counter-revolution. And for some analysts and for some thinkers, uh, this loop is always bad. These would be uh, kind of the reactionary thinkers who want nothing more than to escape the modernity loop and escape from the uh, definitional conflicts and polarization of the French Revolution. And there's, I think, two flavors, especially as I've spent some time in Europe, you get a sense of uh, the European reactionaries, they want to look to the past. They dream of uh, restoring the aristocratic uh, system, restoring even a hereditary monarchy, um, restoring the kind of pre-French Revolution tradition or in other countries uh, even later than that. While if you look at American reactionaries, um, they have kind of an interesting look. They actually are reactionaries looking towards the future, some kind of techno-monarchy or post-democratic system. Um, and of course, my own view is that uh, uh, some of these analyses are correct in that this modernity cycle is perhaps inherent in a democratic system. Um, but I think that, the, look, the reactionaries of the right are wrong in their universal judgment. Um, and in fact, a more balanced view, I think a more accurate view, would look at this and say that, well, sometimes it is good, for example, um, American abolitionism. This was a kind of revolutionary fervor or a drive for equality that was backed by passionate public support that was morally just and led to more just outcomes. And of course, sometimes it's bad. Uh, if you look at the Chinese Cultural Revolution, they tried to radically level society. They divided into oppressor classes and oppressed classes. Um, and it ended in bloodshed, chaos, hardship, destruction, starvation, murder in the streets. Um, no positive uh, outlook, and certainly when Deng Xiaoping came in um, around the kind of turn into the 1980s, as China adapted a more capitalist economic system, a more moderate cultural position, things improved incrementally for the Chinese people. And so, one of the things that I talked about with uh, Eric Hendricks was that he was asking me, he said, Chris, you know, does the woke revolution fit into this schema, fit into this pattern? Um, does it follow this cycle? And kind of superficially, maybe you could say tentatively, yes. Certainly this fervor of revolution uh, has taken on a new tone or a new 
uh, specific um, uh, uh, content. This is the drive for not you know, French uh, uh, revolutionary equality, but for American racial equity. That's the new uh, interpretation of this cycle. Um, the violence, perhaps, the kind of descent into a period of terror. Uh, I, I think looking at the summer of 2020 and the kind of George Floyd riots, uh, kind of mayhem, looting, chaos, uh, murder, uh, rioting throughout the United States, you know, the largest civil unrest um, in, since the last uh, cycle uh, in the 1960s that we talked about, the late 1960s. Um, certainly can be categorized as a period of violent terror. And I think now we're actually entered a period of somewhat of a retrenchment. If you look at Black Lives Matter as a movement, it is in total disarray. Uh, the BLM leadership has kind of uh, <laughs> turned into really a, a, a scam. Uh, they're draining money out of their nonprofits. Their organizations are under lawsuits. Um, and I think the money is really has stopped flowing into BLM's coffers. And their signature policy priority, which was defund the police, that was really the mantra of 2020, um, has been thrown into shambles. Um, even those very left-wing municipalities, such as the city of Seattle or city of San Francisco or city of Minneapolis, they're now actually desperately trying to rehire police and expand police presence. Um, and of course, um, with public opinion polling, even even at that time, 2020, 2021, um, they were never able to convince a minority or a majority rather, or even a significant plurality to support a, such a nonsensical policy as abolishing uh, police departments. And so maybe the question is why? What are the dynamics of this cycle or this part of that loop? Um, and in my view, the woke revolution faces a crucial paradox. Uh, in the United States, we have achieved full political and legal equality for now you know, close to 60, 70 years. You have uh, in 1964 and 1965, the finishing elements of full legal equality, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, et cetera. Um, and in fact, you actually have in some cases uh, legal discrimination on behalf of racial minorities against uh, predominantly white and Asian Americans. Um, this is something like in college admissions and in other facets of our society. Um, we have legalized um, what, would, what some might call anti-racist discrimination. Uh, don't agree with that, but we'll accept the term on face value for this analysis. And so if you take it as the goal of the declaration that all men are created equal, we've realized that in our positive law over this long and sometimes painful process, you have achieved really full legal equality. There is no uh, legal discrimination against racial minority groups. There is no legal discrimination uh, against uh, women, for example. And so you've created the conditions of full political equality, and yet you do see, of course, um, social and material inequalities on a whole host of measures from some of the more social conditions like family structure, to the more economic conditions, such as uh, um, uh, you know, household income, to then the kind of, kind of criminal, criminal justice conditions. So for example, uh, crime rates, arrest rates, incarceration rates, those things are different on the basis of, uh, of, of statistics. Those things are unequal. And I think that what happens is that the woke revolution is, that in a, is in a sense a revolution at the end of equality. Um, they have nothing else to fight for in the realm of law, in the realm of equal individual rights. And so they've created a new revolutionary slogan for racial equity, which says that we've, um, in some sense, abandoned the regime of equal individual rights. We're no longer fighting for that, we've, we've achieved that, and in fact, that's insufficient. And so what they're trying to cobble together is a new ideology that says that we want to categorize people based on group identity, and then equalize outcomes across every axis, predominantly economic axes, health axes, um, uh, employment axes, criminal justice axes, and then uh, uh, formalize, um, and then enforce, really, a leveling. And 
they face a paradox. This is actually not very easy. This is very difficult and, in fact, um, I think is somewhat impossible. If you look at even the Chinese uh, revolution, uh, cultural revolution in the 1960s, I mean, they could tell you uh, what to do. They could throw you in prison. They could tell you where to work. They could toss you out of power. They could, uh, you know, drag your family out into the streets. They could steal all of your goods. They could kick you out of your house. They had um, a program of economic and social leveling that was more totalitarian and more um, drastic than anything that had ever happened in the past, um, the level of specificity of this program. And after it collapsed, after the period of retrenchment, social scientists looked at these data and said, actually, the families who were in power, who were maybe um, more prominent or wealthier prior to the Cultural Revolution, even after this disaster where their, their assets were seized uh, or they were sent into the countryside and, and, in kind of famine conditions. Um, then fast forward a generation later, those initial inequalities had somewhat stabilized. Whether that's just or unjust, we could even leave aside, but the point is that um, forced leveling is very elusive. It's very difficult to achieve, even when you are doing it at the, at, the, at the tip of a spear or at the point of a gun. And so the woke revolution is a really a revolution uh, for equality, but also against equality. Um, it posits a, a future that is egalitarian um, when it's really looking at a terrain and a status quo that, is, um, that has been fully egalitarian for quite some time. And so I think that one way of thinking about this is that the American regime, in the words of uh, the Harvard professor Harvey Mansfield, is a democracy that democratizes. And so it's never satisfied. And perhaps it was an illusion to think that it would be satisfied as at the level of political equality. And I think that the founders, in many ways, saw this coming. They, I think, uh, envisioned the abolition of slavery, envisioned a system of equal rights um, that would have to be done prudentially over time. But the founders envisioned uh, a mixed regime. They envisioned a constitutional republic. And they thought that what you needed was a, a, a democratic system mixed with a, a kind of mixed system in the House and the Senate, and then also a, really an aristocratic system. And Jefferson has these beautiful passages where he says, that you want an aristocracy of talent, an aristocracy of merit, so that not people by birth, not people who are sanctioned there by wealth or by an appointment through the kind of clerical structure as it was in the old countries of Europe, but actually an aristocracy that took the best people from all over society that had immense talent, immense learning, immense capacity, a vision of the good that could then serve as a leadership class. And of course, the, the, the woke revolution is for absolute leveling. It's against any kind of aristocracy of merit because they want to have equality of outcomes. They want to have an absolute democratic leveling. And of course, you know, this even in the American context is impossible. They're going up against something very difficult. And if you look at what happened in the 1960s, you have full legal equality, but you also had the great society programs that were you know, passed and signed by Lyndon Johnson. The war on poverty was the most significant. And these programs have grown over time to the point that now, according to a, my friend and colleague, Robert Rector at Heritage, who has done some of the analysis, the United States government spends more than $1 trillion a year on means-tested welfare programs that, in a kind of racial grouping analysis, uh, go disproportionately towards uh, racial minority households um, in disproportionately American cities. And so you've spent trillions of dollars over time. You've deployed, you know, a trillion dollars a year in ongoing spending in order to uh, abolish poverty, in order to uh, create equality of opportunity, in order to yield more uh, equal outcomes uh, on the basis of uh, not race in this case, but on the basis of class. Um, although there is a racial component if you analyze it in that way. And in essence, this project has failed. Um, you know, the country is not uh, more equal. The, the poverty has not been alleviated. And the social conditions that are the greatest contributors to po poverty, um, 
family structure, educational attainment, um, uh, and participation in means-tested welfare programs um, has only grown, certainly on an absolute basis on many of those measures, but even something like family structure uh, on a relative basis. We're in much worse conditions than we are 70 years ago. And so in the face of this overwhelming evidence, in the face of experimentation, uh, in the face of the basic political problem, um, what I think the woke revolution amounts to at the end um, is a program of nihilism. So what you didn't hear a lot of were positive policy priorities for alleviating conditions of poverty, for uh, repairing family conditions, not just in black families, but also Latino and white families who are increasingly uh, resembling one another in the dissolution of a two-parent family. Um, you didn't hear any uh, kind of grand economic vision, whether it was reminiscent of FDR or LBJ, for transforming the country, for uh, beautifying the cities, for uh, creating job opportunities for the uh, unemployed or the, or the disadvantaged. You heard defund the police, abolish the family, um, you know, uh, uh, destroy systemic whiteness. These aren't serious political priorities. These are nihilistic and operate on pure negation. They want to destroy systems. They want to create villains. And they're so captured by the destructive side of the revolution for equality that they didn't even feel the need to propose any substantive and, and really transformative policy priorities that honestly probably wouldn't have worked anyways if we used the past as a judge. But they, they didn't even see the program of kind of racial equity as doing something in that way. And so the question is for the future. Um, uh, I think a lot of people are asking this. Are we at the end of woke? Are we at the beginning of woke? Where are we on this cycle? Um, the question is really, did, was 2020 enough to move us into a, that cyclical change toward the disillusionment, retrenchment, and stabilization? Um, and I think that 2024 will be, in a sense, perhaps provide us with somewhat of an answer to that question. You have Trump, you have DeSantis, you have Biden, um, all of whom offer a unique proposition, a unique answer to that question that they will then pitch to the American people. The American people will have a chance to vote. Um, I think it's possible, certainly. It's not uh, maybe 50% or greater, but I think it's a, a plausible scenario that you could have a a, a, a victory from on the conservative side, someone like Ron DeSantis, who could even usher in a Nixon-like victory, 68 or 72. Um, that's something that I certainly think is possible. Um, you could have a Trump-driven acceleration, uh, perhaps a reinvigoration of the left-wing racialist ideology that is fueled by Trump's uh, a kind of combative media style that leads us into deeper into that cycle. Or you could have Joe Biden, who, on the surface level, um, plays with the policies, certainly passes executive orders, but is really a caretaker government and would be stabilized by congressional opposition, I think. And so what do I see as the most likely scenario? I think that we are probably already in a period of stabilization. Um, I think that there are certain things that could change that. But I don't see that the BLM movement can regain some of its uh, most powerful media narratives and most powerful public support. I think they've really burned many bridges with the public. There is, however, a danger that is latent in this new system that we have, is that the revolution at the end of equality that I think we are in doesn't operate at the surface as an explicit political movement. I think that might be um, decaying slightly. But I think that it does operate laterally through the bureaucracy. And what it does is that it filters the revolutionary language through language of the therapeutic, language of the kind of pedagogical, or language of the corporate HR department. And then it establishes power anti-democratically or kind of bypassing the democratic structure, and then uses this manipulative and soft language in order to continue the revolution within the institutions. This is something that we'll have to fight. We'll have to get more sophisticated in fighting because if we're gonna have truly a period of stabilization, 
uh, truly a period of maybe realization that we have an ideal, um, this legal and political equality matched with a sense of civic virtue, matched, matched with a sense of uh, private charity from the civil sector in order to improve some of those underlying social problems that could yield more substantive equality over time. Um, we're going to have to contend with this problem of bureaucracy. And there may be, in some cases, more collapse of standards, uh, more periods of chaos, more acceleration uh, before uh, we're actually uh, able to fight this fight. And so what I think will happen ultimately, if the woke revolution proceeds at, a, at really any pace, you're going to see a decay of standards, you're going to see a rejection of merit, you're going to see even some serious dysfunction in all of our industries and in all of our companies and all of our institutions of education. Um, and so we'll be continuing this fight. It'll be a tactical fight for now. Um, and so I would say for anyone who is a supporter of political equality, a, sort, a supporter of a constitutional republic, uh, and a supporter of uh, a, an aristocracy of merit or talent that could guide and lead and shape uh, the, the democracy that we have in the United States, get ready for a fight. Um, get ready to push back um, because it's probably not over. These things happen to go in small as well as large cycles, and I think that's what's to come.